Yes, hello everybody. Um, yeah, really nice to be here. Uh, my presentation is going to be about hacking from the browser. It has been repeated like six times now. Uh, so a bit about me. I'm uh, Thomas Yos. I'm working at a boutique pen testing company called Seconzul that has been uh, lately acquired by Athos. So now this is like a second old slash ethos company. Uh, my main, main areas of expertise is like I'm mainly focusing on internal pen testing and red teaming. And a bit of embedded system security. Lately, haven't done much uh, on that one. But like my favorite area is um, implementing and testing network uh, and authentication protocols. So this talk is starting as um, as me working at Seconds Old, but the main uh, talk is going to be a bit uh, different. So treat it as a, a word from our sponsors, and it's not Race Shadow Legend. Uh, Seconds Old, we are like a multinational company doing everything that's like an IT security company does. Internal pen testing, red teaming, giving advice about uh, procedures and uh, and whatnot. So yeah, we are um, in Zurich. We are a bit of a uh, segregated from the rest of the second result uh, group, but still like we have good communications. But uh, since um, um, I'm living here since like two years now, and I feel that like uh, Swiss companies prefer to work with like Swiss clients and. Yeah, uh, it shows, it shows. Uh, anyhow, so this was a word from our sponsor, and here is the second slide, which is going to be about the word from a second sponsor that is actually bringing you this tool. Scene change, this is my night job. I'm working at Porchetta, sorry, Porchetta Industries. Uh, I'm originally from Hungary, so I'm going to pronounce it Porchetta, just so the Spanish and Italian speakers are going to get a heart attack every time I'm saying it. <laughs> So my presentation is about hacking from the browser, also known as uh, let's see how much one thread can handle. Um, yeah, this one thread is going to be a recurring theme in this talk and uh, and all across the browser, sadly. So another introduction slide. Um, again, I'm Thomas Yours, but in my uh, non-day job, but my night job, I'm like kind of like Batman. I'm doing open source development of a lot of uh, small and big projects alike. And uh, most of these projects are incorporated under the umbrella of Porchetta Industries. Uh, you can pick up some uh, stickers if you like uh, after the talk. Uh, it's conveniently placed next to the SAC console booth, so maybe we can lure in some customers as well. Uh, so um, one of my bigger, uh, like um, the projects that are under Porchetta and what I'm, let's say, most proud of is maybe the biggest one is uh, PyPyCats. Uh, if you haven't heard, it's been out there since like three years now. Uh, PyPyCats is like Mimikatz, but it is uh, completely ported to Python. Uh, this means that uh, because it's Python, it works completely platform uh, in a platform-independent manner. So you can parse your else's dumps anywhere uh, as you wish. This incorporates uh, anti uh, anti-major version 6 and major version 5, so Windows 2003 and XP is wel still welcome. You don't need to install anything else. Besides that, I'm like doing some, you know, smaller side projects like uh, um, re-implementing the entire Impacket uh, stack, uh, which is under AIOSMB. I don't know if I have a pointer here. Oh, cool. Oh, it's green. Awesome. So AIOSMB is basically like a fully asynchronous SMB client for Python. It is supporting Py um, SMB version 2 and 3. And it has like um, a lot of uh, major, um, how to say, like uh, ease of life uh, improvements. Also, we have um, Artwolf, which is the RDP slash VNC client against, uh, again, pure Python, asynchronous. Uh, ANTLM Relay, it's like kind of like Responder plus um, uh, plus Impacets and TLM Relay and uh, Jackdaw, which is like the the biggest of all of these tools, which is like I'm pretty familiar that most of the penetration testers here at least, uh, I hope the SOC analysts as well, uh, have heard of Bloodhound. It is a full po uh, Python port of Bloodhound that is not using Neo4j, but is using an in-memory graph uh, representation. And uh, this means that 
unlike Bloodhound, this one can run in uh, Raspberry Pi Zero as well. So feel free to try out. All of these projects are, are open source on my GitHub page here. So, but we are not here for, for these projects. That's a lie, actually. We are here for these projects as well. But these projects are going to be bundled in Octopome. So this presentation is going to be about what is Octopone, why is Octopone, how does it work? Uh, please note that everything that I'm going to explain here, it's a two hours long talk. And I needed to compress everything in 40 uh, minutes, including the demo as well. So we are going to be rapid firing slides from here. Uh, we are going to see demos, uh, lots of it, and of course we are, have uh, implementation challenges. There were a lot of implementation challenges, so I can cram everything inside of a browser. We are not going to talk about that today, but the slides are going to be public, and then feel free to browse them at your heart's content. And uh, I'm open for questions later on as well. So, what is Octopon? Octopon is a penetration testing framework that is running entirely, almost entirely, inside of your browser. That means that if you scan this QR code or if you enter this URL, right now you can open it, you can execute it. It's going to basically give you, uh, let's think of it as like a lightweight metasploit uh, that, is, that is just like, it's just, it just works. Of course, um, the people who know about like the underlying technologies, which is... Uh, WebAssembly, AM, Script, and Empyodyne. We are going to get into more details about that later on. You might be asking the questions like, how is it possible that it works? <clears throat> like on browser, we cannot have like network socket access. For that one, this is why I'm, I'm always uh, saying like an, with an asterisk that everything is inside of a browser. A small binary needs to run on your uh, computer that does the web sockets to TCP and UDP translations. But since everything is inside of the web browser and nothing is being uh, actively detected, and hopefully this is not going to be changed uh, by EDRs or, uh, or antivirus systems, this means that uh, if the binary, if you can get the binary executed, then you are basically good to go and you can continue your work. Uh, yes, so I mentioned technologies such as uh, Biodyne, WebAssembly, and Mscripton, but before I get into that, there is a missing slide here. Um, I just got the information that I would need to talk also about what this project is not aimed for. Okay, so like this project is not a lead browser exploit that is going to chew up your, your computers from the inside because this is running inside of the browser and frankly, I'm not making browser exploits public to, the, uh, to everybody. Uh, also, like I don't even know how to do those. Uh, the other thing is that it is uh, it is running inside of your browser. That means that it has all the safeguards as anything else that is running inside of your browser. So again, like please don't be scared about this. This is a tool, so you can do pen testing in a way that is going to be time efficient for pen testers or for CTF players. And it also, uh, I'm going to show that it has file parsers for exotic file types such as uh, mini dumps. Uh, I think I already talked about the mini dumps for some reason, and also also NTDS and also registry files. So like, you can use it not just as a pen testing slash attacking tool, but like if you want to browse some registry, then you will be able to do that. And now again, you don't need to install anything. So I was talking about WebAssembly. WebAssembly is the core component that Octopone uses. Like, what is WebAssembly? Uh, like, WebAssembly, it's a huge topic. So just for the sake of this presentation, think of it as a virtual machine that is running inside of your browser. It has been running inside of your browser since 2017. I don't know how many of you have noticed, uh, because I'm asking this because uh, WebAssembly is still still trying to get to its, let's say, golden ages. Uh, not many people have realized uh, what is being like uh, what um, different like exotic aspects the browser support. So WebAssembly is basically you can take your binary code, you can co cross compile it, execute it in WebAssembly, and your already existing binary code, which is like super uh, super easy to compile uh, with a bit big asterisk. Um, is going to be able to access DOM and JavaScript and basically like, therefore, almost all uh, basic browser functions. 
which is like really cool because like it gives you a speed advantage. Like this is a like an actual compiled code, not an interpreted code. This is not going to slow down your computer. For example, you can make video games. Like if you are us using uh, Unity, then Unity is going to, and we are writing a game, for example, and Unity is going to compile everything into WebAssembly because it is that fast that you can actually do a 3D game. Uh, like you can launch a 3D game there. The other technology that uh, that I need to Gl uh, glance over is mscripton. mscripton, uh, basically think of it as a, as a glue that, uh, holds your, um, like already existing binary code, um, and like sticks it to WebAssembly so it can, it can run. Uh, but more importantly, like this is like an SDK. Uh, so besides doing compilation, this SDK also, all, like, Almost, almost virtualizing an entire operating system for you because WebAssembly is not an operating system. It's a binary execution environment. Therefore, for example, you don't have five systems on the WebAssembly right now, at least. In the future, there might be coming some extensions. Like this, uh, this topic is rapidly changing. Uh, and WebAssembly is constantly expanding. So, mscriptan, uh, I told you in the previous slide that, uh, um, like it's not really easy to compile, uh, code. To WebAssembly, mscripten does its best to uh, to allow you to compile your existing code into WebAssembly. It gives you a file system, like an in-memory file system. So uh, it gives you pthread, basically em uh, emulation, because WebAssembly by default is not going to support threads for you. And they can they they did it. It's like it's borderline magic for me. But we are not discussing these ones. Pydyne Pydyne is basically a C interpreter. Uh, sorry. Uh, C Python interpreter uh, with some patches applied, so now mscript then can compile uh, C Python directly to WebAssembly. This means that since we have um, this uh, Pyodyne, uh, Pyodyne is basically just like Python that is running inside of the browser. Uh, and it is super awesome. Why it is super awesome? Because the authors of Pyodyne, it was originally a Mozilla project, by the way, um, probably still is. Um, so Pyodyne can give you um, access, like um, access to the Python code, like sorry, the Python code running inside of Pyodyne context can access DOM and JavaScript via mscript slash WebAssembly. And basically you can create an entire web page dynamically just by using Python, if you wish. Uh, because some, I heard that some people don't like JavaScript. I don't know why. Uh, also, you have access to DOM. And uh, most importantly, it is going to give you a translation proxy. This means that from JavaScript now, uh, you will be able to directly access, under certain conditions, Python's heap directly, without any uh, additional copy uh, mechanisms. This means that like, if you are writing a game in Python, for example, then like you can get the frame buffers directly displayed on an, uh, on a HTML canvas, which is really good and which Octopon actually uses at some point in time. I'm going to show it in the demo. Uh, so what do we have? So the basically the hierarchy here that like WebAssembly, uh, mscripten is gluing Pyodyne into the WebAssembly and Pyodyne is executing Octopon. Octopone internally has uh, a few components, more of them, uh, more on uh, about these later. So we have core, client, scanners, util servers. Servers is still uh, under development. Why is Octopone? Quickly, uh, because yeah, we are getting to the demo soon. So why is Octopone? Uh, as I have explained, I'm a penetration tester slash red teamer. And uh, especially during penetration testing, I have a lot of frustrations with a lot of our uh, customers. Uh, sorry for the people who are our customers and sitting in on the, in, in the inside of the rows, but like this is this is sadly currently the reality. Uh, I can't start my job in time because the customers are either unwilling or unable to provide uh, like actual access to their networks, to their test points. I don't know on what operating system I would need to have my initial access point at. I don't know if I can bring my laptop in or not. I don't know. Therefore, I don't know. And also, I don't know what type of AV, EDR, XDR, or DDR, whatever the customers are executing on these endpoints that I eventually would need to uh, need to work on. And also for 
for reporting uh, because like I need to gather evidences so I can help my customer fix their their network vulnerabilities, but those, need, it is, uh, those evidence files needs to be transferred out somehow from the customer environment. And a lot of tools providing different, um, uh, different file formats um, is, just, is just a mess right now. And I'm losing time for this. And I don't like to lose time because I'd rather be like uh, spending time on the report, that was a lie, um, <laughs> <laughs> to make the customer happy. So. Uh, a quick summary of the issues, what I explained. So we have too many tools. Uh, what can you do about like too many tools if you are going against a customer who has like this EDR or antivirus solutions? You can either like obfuscate, like ho first of all, hope that the tools are not going to be detected. Eventually they are. So you have obfuscation or you can just like rewrite the tools. I don't know who is like uh, that crazy to rewrite complex tools from scratch. Uh, but eventually it's going to be detected. So like it's always like you need to play a game against the AV and the EDR, which is completely fine if you are doing a red teaming, but we are doing pen test. Please don't do this to us. We are losing time. Uh, and of course, like, oh, sorry, we cannot disable the, the antivirus or, or whatever. <sighs> so moving on. Yeah, I'm venting a little, not just because I'm nervous, but because I'm angry about this top, uh, this point. So tools are not platform independent. Since I don't know if I can if I can use my laptop with Windows and Linux or whatever VM I would like to use, or I need to use the customer provided environment, is it going to be Windows? Is it going to be CentOS? Is it going to be Red Hat? Uh, I know that you are not paying for the licenses, so like, is it going to be CentOS again? Uh, the the thing is that's like uh, I need to deal with these things just in order to get started. Uh, Tools producing different data formats. I don't want to write yet another Python script because, uh, because like uh, structured data formats in open source penetration testing tooling is, yeah, uh, questionable. Like everybody has their own ideas on how to, uh, how to create structured uh, output. Uh, reproducibility and fixed verification. This might not be crossing many people's mind, but the problem is that's like, if I give a recommendation that's like, Hey, like we have seen that like you are using I, I don't know, so like there is a vulnerability. If I if I press the button on this executable that I downloaded from GitHub, because I trust the author and I also like check the code and yada yada yada, of course, because everybody does that. Uh, uh, I will write it in the recommendations that's like, hey, like don't call me to test if you have managed to fix the vulnerability, run this code with this executable. If it's going to provide you the output that's not vulnerable anymore, then you can sleep well. Uh, but the problem is that the customer is like, yeah, but like this is like a random binary that I'm downloading. I don't even know what it does. Should I be turning it off, turning off the EDR? I'm like, now you can turn off the EDR, but like when I was doing the test, you couldn't, like, uh, whatever. Uh, so they have they have they have these these problems like the tools are not coming from a from a trusted source and for a trusted source for me who knows some of the tool developers personally okay is not the same trust as what the customer would would expect and yeah some of the tools tools are not user friendly I'm mostly getting this from the colleagues it's like Thomas you're writing like really cool tools but like the input parameters are like not standard and like this is not how everybody else does it and and also like you're writing this tool but like it doesn't have a GUI and I'm like why do you need a GUI like you just need to know how the tool works again whatever okay I can do I can I can do that like I can do that for you so like I can write you a GUI I can write you a GUI I'm still going to use the CLI uh, we can we can do <laughs> we can do reproducibility uh, if we are using that one framework that is super easy to install and we know that like it's going to be cross platform. Uh, we are like it's like by design because it's running inside of the browser. It's platform independent and yeah, if we are just writing like one framework with plugins inside, then we are sort, uh, sorting out the tool many tools issue. So how does it work? Uh, so uh, some of the things that I, uh, I already mentioned, so um, I'm just going to uh, skim over this part. Yeah, no, this part is actually important. So like inside of the browser, uh, via WebAssembly, via Python, you only get one thread and one thread only. 
mscript and can virtualize threads. But hey, again, this is Python that we are talking about. I hope that not many people are using the import threading from Python for obvious reasons. Uh, so if we are not writing everything in asynchronous way using asyncio, then whenever we are trying to reach out for uh, like a virtualized socket or anything blocking, you are going to block the entire browser. This is not really a good user experience, especially like I've always you have to have to, have to click on it. it's like yes, yeah, the JavaScript can still run. Like, please don't please don't reload the page. I have all my tools there. Uh, so at, at Octopon, we have uh, we are defining credential targets proxies. These are like I think everybody knows why. Clients can be currently like these are the clients that are supported. A client is constructed by a tar like defining a target where we want to connect with what credentials over which proxy and the authentication protocol. Like that's quite straightforward. And hey, like these are the libraries that I was talking about. Like you know, like ten minutes ago, roughly. So, input-output handling, I'm going to skim over because I want to show you the demo and we are running out of time. So, basically, initially it was CLI, uh, then now that with Biodyne I could merge everything into the browser, so like other API endpoints needed to be, uh, needed to be freed up or accessible from the outside. Well, I know it's a, it's a bit of a strange because like you can access from, like in Python, everything is pretty much like open and you can access it, but like, you know, like with a proper interface. Um, Sorry. Uh, output handling um, for output handling is just like one virtual X class that you can uh, virtual X class uh, virtual class that you can override and like you are going to get callbacks for any important things that is happening in Octopone. So you can you can use Octopone as a library as well with like one specific module and also can use it as a framework by itself. So this is how we uh, this is how the layout works basically. Like we have some files currently it's empty. We have the pro we have proxies defined targets credentials everything has an ID and everything is being referenced by the the given ID so the input comes in it's usually like a string input handler dispatches it to main main processes the input searches the sessions session is going to basically write to the output handler with a unified interface and the external output handler is going to be like either on CLI, it's going to be just print to the console in a formatted manner or in WebAssembly, basically like you are using the Python to JavaScript interface to access the DOM and update like a text box or, or whatever GUI element that you wish. Uh, so from the browser, uh, brow uh, from the browser, these are the steps to uh, start up Pyodyne. Uh, it's not really important. Um, you can look it up later, and you can cross match it to the uh, to the actual code that you are like seeing in the browser. Right click, check source. So this is how it looks like on CLI. There are some data that I'm that I'm testing this with. So. Uh, this is like the prefer, like this is how I use it, but, uh, it's super easy to reconfigure like all the layouts and do whatever you want. Uh, this is how it looks like on a PC and a browser. If you could not open it, uh, right now, this is how it looks when I'm DC syncing from my smart TV, when I'm working from home. <laughs> and this is how it looks like if I'm in Norway and I'm on a highway. <laughs> So uh, one last one last slide before we head into the demos uh, about networking. Like networking is a, cru a crucial, let's say, issue um, that uh, that needs to be a bit discussed. Uh, so I'm still waiting for Quick to be implemented fully um, and accessible from from JavaScript because that would be a much more superior option. Currently, we are using WebSockets. This means that like WebSocket. Uh, there, there needs to be like a translation binary between like WebSockets and, and TCP or UDP, whatever. So like net, uh, WebSockets networking. Uh, for net, yeah, where are we? Yeah, we need WebSockets. And like this is the most important part. And uh, sorry to bring, uh, sorry for the audience to bring it up that since my, uh, I submitted a long talk, not about this, but about, uh, about uh, like a different, let's say, credential proxying technique to DEF CON, but since it was rejected, now I can talk about this part as well. So what you can achieve is that wherever the, wherever the binary is running without administrator credentials, uh, what you can do is that if you run this uh, as, I don't know, like user of victim one, then all the credentials that are stored inside of LSS 
can be used for authenticating uh, under the context of victim one, but the actual authentication context is going to be mirrored in the browser. Spoiler alert, the browser doesn't have to, uh, doesn't need to be running at the same host that you are running the, the agent on. Okay, so basically it's like if I would be having another machine and this another machine is just a stand running standalone Windows, it is like if I would be running an application on a machine that is uh, running this agent on and I can perform authentication to anywhere in the network. And demo time. Sorry, sorry for the rapid firing, but uh, there are some cool stuff that I would like to like to show here. And it is display settings, standard displays. Now we are going to duplicate these displays, keep changes. Okay, you are seeing the same stuff as me. Awesome. So, yeah, okay. This is how my Octopon looks like. I already like added some test data, but I'm going to revert back to the original form. And how about we are trying to be become domain admin on an Arasaka uh, corp corporate network? This laptop is currently running a virtual machine, uh, multiple virtual machines here, as you can see. Okay, so like we have an Active Directory, we have a file server, we have two workstations. On the second workstation, I can log in because I guess the password of the user, which is password one. This is like a generic user. And we have the super secret dolphin.exe, uh, which is actually our proxy uh, running already. And it's uh, listening on uh, basically like all network interfaces. So going back to the main desktop, I'm going to remove the session files. So you get like a a brand new session, hopefully I have internet. Okay, so this is optional, what I'm doing here, like specifying the proxy, because like without networking, this also has features, but like obviously like the most interesting parts are the uh, networking related. So we have logged, no, 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 not this one. So hopefully I'm getting it right. So now we are loading it. Loading, loading, loading. So basically, Biodyne initialized, fetches Octopone. Octopone is currently running in the background. So this is how this is how currently looks like. I am not a good GUI developer. Okay, I'm just I'm just putting it putting it out. Uh, what you're what you're having here immediately is that you have an in-memory file system that you can browse. Currently, there is one static and uh, one volatile folder. In the static folder, you can uh, fetch the session files. The session files are backed by uh, the local browser FS. So basically, they are pretty much uh, static for this specific tab, for this specific URL, for this specific uh, uh, URI. Uh, browser security is awesome. And we have volatile, which is basically just a, a currently empty in memory backed file system. So as discussed previously in the slides, we would need to add the credential. I'm not going to show you the, uh, the, the credential proxying right now. It's going to be uh, maybe a later talk. So, so the domain is Arasaka. We already have a username of victim that we guessed. And we have a password, so we create a credential. We add the target. The target is going to be at first the IP address of the domain controller. Uh, by the way, like there is a feature to automatically guess all this information. I'm just showing that's like we, we can do this here. We are going to add it. Okay, and now let's create a, a, a client. So here, if I'm creating client, it's going to open a site tab. Let's do SMB first, and then we can get get into the uh, to the hacky hacky stuff. So. Here we already selected the proper credential, the proper target, and the proper proxy. We hit on create client. We have a new tab specifically for SMB. If we go back to the clients, then we see that's like this is client uh, client number two. And if we type login, then hopefully ah, login success. Awesome. Uh, we are in, but hey, like we are not administrator. This is just a victim victim stuff. But what can you do here in this SMB client? You would say that, like, as a victim, not much. Okay, but like here in the file browser, now we have 
a second like virtual folder or virtual mount, what can we do here? If I double click on it, hey, you have a SMB5 browser inside of the browser. This is like browserception. So you can uh, browse the files and, uh, and everything here. Now, but hey, let's, let's check if there are, some, there are some vulnerabilities or let's try to get some you know, information. Like, try, let's try to map up the domain. So for that one, I would recommend using LDAP first, creating an LDAP client with the already existing uh, credentials, targets, and proxies is just that simple. If you log in, oop, nope, log in, hit enter, okay, log in, okay, I might be lying to you, we, not, we will never know. Well, hey, there is a new mount point, what do we have here? Oh, my God, we have an LDAP browser in the browser. I already double clicked on it, like it takes it takes a while to, to load because like yeah, it is in beta. Okay, so like everything is still is still uh, going on. So but here like it's like it's not that uh, it's not enough just to see the <coughs> the distinguished names and the common names. Uh, here are the actual like uh, add up attributes for the given uh, common name. Yeah, I know the GUI is not we, we are working on it. We are working on it. Okay, but hey, what to, what to do now? So, oh, sorry. Uh, so we have uh, Kerberos. Let's see what we can do with Kerberos. If I log in, ah, I cannot log into Kerberos. Like there is no such thing. But let's see. Fetching a TGT is just that simple. Okay, let's do a Kerberos thing, huh? Kerberos thing does not work because it requires an SPM. Oh my God, what what do we do? So now we have two options, like we can go back to the LDAP client and list out all the Kerberos stable users, or since these clients can interact with one, uh, one another, if I just go back to the clients and if I go to, so let's say like this is LDAP, the LDAP is sitting on number three and it's already logged in, so I can just instruct Kerberos thing on number three, and then we are going to wait for, <coughs> for a while because this uh, test data was uh, created by Bad Blood, but here you go. You have the tickets, you can immediately copy paste them into Hashcat. Uh, besides this, like Kerberos module has a lot of other features. Now, uh, let's say uh, I'm going to focus on the like cool, cool stuff and then we are going to do to the actual hacky hacky stuff because I don't know where we are with the time. So let's say that we already administrator. Okay, so like administrator has the same password as the victim user because uh, because like this is a real life penetration testing, <laughs> and let's say that's like we would like to log into the domain controller, but this time over RDP. So let's see how this RDP is going to perform. Yes, this is a this is a full RDP stack that is running inside of your browser now. It is usable. There are certain things that you should never do. For example, <laughs> for example, like sliding a window, <laughs> because that is going to that is going to take some time. However, let's see, like uh, what other hidden features are here in the RDP section. So we have a notepad. So I can say it's like, "Hello world." Select, right click, copy. Then if we go back to the RDP login session, oh, clipboard works as well. So, oh, but this is just one way. So what happens if I type like, uh, paste, hello, uh, 41. Go back to RDP, do enter, right click, Paste, hello area 41. So this was just the RDP. Uh, let's log out. And I have shown you in the slides, if you recall it, that I have a tool called Jackdaw, which is like Bloodhound. Okay, so like, uh, any guesses if Bloodhound is, is here in the browser? <laughs> okay. So I'm not going to show you the actual like uh, data acquisition because we are going to run out of time, but since everything in, uh, 
Bloodhound is, uh, sorry, Jagdo is uh, file based, uh, like uh, SQLite file based. I hope that I will be having a ah, presentation files. I already create, uh, like, uh, I already did the, the acquisition there, which you can do it again. It's not just for presentation, but like if you are going at the client and want to show the, all the data, then you can just reload it back to the browser and it can work in any browser in any device, even on your mobile phone, it works. So let's create a utility, which is Jackdo. We can do db load and then this db file. Okay. Do we have any trusts? No. Trusts? Oh, no trusts. No problem. And then we can do graph load one. This one. The, gra the one is the graph ID, but like here currently we only define one graph. So let's check path to DA. Uh, also, it can import existing Bloodhound data. So you now don't need to install uh, Neo4j if you don't like to for some reasons. Uh, but you can directly use it from here. Also, like we can check the, the DC sync, Kerberos to Ball to DA, Astro Pros to Ball to DA, and like, uh, yeah, the HVT and the owned uh, set part. Like, if I would learn how to use SQL, uh, then yeah, then it would work. But currently, it doesn't. Uh, yes. So, but I promise you that we are going to do some hacky hacky stuff. How much time do we have left? By the way, okay, okay, okay. Cool, cool, cool. Uh, so let, then we have some time for some hacky hacky stuff. So, like, uh, let's check in LDAP that we already logged in and it keeps the session open, so you don't have to log in again. Uh, what do, what type of uh, what, what can we check here? So oh yeah, for example, I can do this one. Uh, I specifically added this one because uh, ADR, DDR, whatever protections don't really like if I type who am I on the terminal because apparently I'm a nasty hacker if I if I can do that. But here it's not going to be detected because it's directly pulling all the all the uh, group tokens from LDAP. Uh, anyhow, so like I would say that's like. Maybe there are some uh, Active Directory certificate services templates that might be vulnerable here. Let's check those. So I added, um, like, basically, I reported CertiPy. And yeah, it seems that like, there is an SAP module. This is completely not taken from an already existing scenario that I encountered like two weeks ago. Uh, so there is like an SAP template, which is, seems to be vulnerable because the enrollee supplies subject, mm, alternate names, and also like we have enrollment rights as the member of the domain users group. So let's let's see if we can if we can do something with that. So let's say where where this uh, um, service is located. Oh, it's conveniently located in the Active Directory because fuck security, I guess. Uh, so here we can do a cert. Certificate request. So for certificate request, we would need to go back to LDAP. We know the certificate name. SMB, copy paste. Yeah, I should be. I know that I. And let's do administrator. Maybe we would like to receive a, a certificate that contains the name administrator and the subject alt name. Hmm? It takes a few seconds because uh, we need to generate some random numbers and I mean like prime numbers and you know it takes a while. Anyhow, so it seems that we have got in fact a certificate and in fact the certificate after reparsing the the, uh, the certificate it has uh, administrator inside. But where where is the certificate? Like here, there's a file. But where is this file? Okay, so if I would be able to implement a refresh. In the file browser, um, here is here is a PFX file. Okay, can we use this PFX uh, PFX file right now and log in over SMB, for example, to the domain controller? Heck, yes, we can. Let's do it. 
For this one, I'm creating a new target because this is uh, Kerberos that we are talking about now, and Kerberos is kind of picky on the, the DCs and the ROMs and, and whatnot. So I'm going to actually a -R -A -R -A -A -D one okay? A R A R A A D. Oh, I, I hope that this is correct. Okay, so here in the credentials, I can create a new credential that says we are administrator, but the password is admin, uh, and the authentication type is uh, certificate file. Certificate file is here. The, the secret of admin is the password of the certificate of the PFX file. Just like this is why we are using that one. Okay, it has been created. Uh, kind of surprising. Cool. So we create another session, which is going to be SMB, but this type Kerberos. And credential number two is selected here. This means that certificate is going to be used. I hope that this is going to work out of the box, man. Login. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. <laughs> so now that we are administrator, we immediately DCS in KRBTGT because this is what good pen testers do. <laughs> And yeah, we just we just stole our second domain. Um, what else? Uh, that yeah, this is just a subset of of everything that we can we can do here. By the way, so like I encourage everybody, please test it, try it out. Uh, one more thing before we go to the Q and A section, because then I'm going to get kicked off the, uh, kicked the, off the stage. Uh, LDAP, so. There is a hidden hidden target enum command on LDAP that is going to basically like magically populate like all the servers and hosts into the targets uh, uh, targets field. And here you can create a scanner. We have a few scanners defined uh, that can basically use the or the uh, predefined targets table to to target the stuff. Uh, yeah, one thing is this like. You cannot exclude targets, sadly. You can just like either manually add it, but we are working on it. Yes, so uh, I think this is in a nutshell. We can go back to the, uh, not this part, but to the Q&A section. Questions, answers? Or I, I can talk for two more hours. That's, that, that's fine by me as well. I think that would be... Uh, turn, turn on the mic. I need to turn it on. Can you hear me? Yes? Cool. Yeah, I think that would be appreciated by many. Uh, I would encourage that we move the follow-ups to the barbecue. Yeah, sure, 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 yeah. sure, sure. No but, problem. Uh, yeah, let's, let's do a bit of Q&A. We have a couple of minutes, so raise your hand if you have questions. There's one there, there's one there. So we're going to start here. Yeah, I wouldn't say it would work because you're going to get to cocky later otherwise. <laughs> but yeah, very nice. Thanks for the GUI. Uh, my question was like, uh, you can copy paste on RDP. Can you also copy paste binaries and stuff? Like files, you yeah. mean? Uh, no, that is uh, like theoretically it could be possible, but it is like too. It was too complicated, and I already spent like years of work doing putting everything together. Like we can, it's it's in the works. Okay, so like eventually you will be able to, but there are certain criteria that needs to be met. And uh, it's not always available uh, in the bra like uh, via the agent. Okay. Hey, Tomas, this is brilliant. Thanks for the presentation. Um, this proxy dolphin executable is key that everything works still, unfortunately. So for the networking part. For but for most of the things you do, you need that networking part, right? Well, I mean, like it depends on what you are using it. Like, if you want to have a full blown access, then obviously you would need to have ex like networking access to the to the target network. Otherwise, like there is no tool that is going to help you in <laughs> in communicating with the servers. My, my question actually would be: there is nothing malicious in there, but 
do you think it will, because it's tied to your framework tool, it will be picked up by the AV vendors at some point and uh, need to I, work around it? I hope not, but uh, I think like the protocol itself, it is a custom protocol, however, is that simple. So like within like 200 lines of code, you can replicate this code in any programming language, or maybe not in brain fucking assembly, but like, <laughs> <laughs> but like you can do it in Go, you can do it in, in whatever your favorite programming language is, uh, language is. And then, then like you don't have to, so the, the, the core is that like you don't have to obfuscate like all the tools. You just need to obfuscate the, the 200 lines, which is like a serious like uh, detection surface reduction, uh, overall. Great, thanks. Yeah. Please raise your hands again if you had them open before, uh, up before. Uh, where, Tom? At the top. Can you shout it out and we'll just repeat it? No? Okay. Yeah. We'll, we'll get back to you. We've got one here. Thank you very much. Um, so you showed how you could create a certificate with uh, the certify option. Yeah. Would it be possible to automatically import this in the credentials section? Same for when you do DC sync. Yes, definitely. Yes, definitely. It can be done. But it's not yet. I'm mean, like, I, it just needs some additional coding and like, you know. It sounds awesome. <laughs> like, Thank you. There are there are a lot of like uh, like potential potential like improvements, but yes, that is that is definitely one. Uh, somebody else was asking me before if like uh, like you can just like grab a mini dump file like an else's dump file from somewhere put it in the browser and it parses it for you. I haven't showed it because of the lack of time. And somebody was asking the questions like, can't we create like a credential objects directly from the, from the, uh, from the mini dump file? And it's like, yes, it's possible. It's just like, again, like additional work. Thank you. I'm going to get one more questions and a question we have to. Um, would you have a way to, your ultimate, your custom protocol that does networking, would you have a way to encapsulate this into, let's say, HTTP and then do it in the other way, such that the client on the, let's say, victim machine would ping back to you and pen test from home then? Uh, yes, you are talking about building a C2. Yes. <laughs> okay, so... Uh, Yes, it's definitely possible to build a C2 with the already existing components. However, this was specifically, like I have specifically designed everything to be like a, a, a tool that I can use for working. Like you can easily, like you can easily modify it. I may or may not have done it, but haven't released it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so this is how I know that yes, it can be done. Okay, this answers my question. Merci. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks I'm, everyone. I'm being kicked off now. Okay. Thanks everyone for the questions and I think this deserves a final round of applause for Thomas. Thanks so much. <laughs>